Uh, I want to first of all thank my co-authors here. Uh, Alexandra Saviatis is currently running our, uh, uh, our seismometer network, which is known as TexNet. Peter Hennings and Ellen Rathje are uh, the, the co-PIs of our, of our consortium, which is the Center for Integrated Seismicity Research, or CISR, so you'll be seeing that uh, uh, pretty much throughout the talk. And Jonathan Osmond is, uh, is the structural geologist that's working on, on the project also. Uh, I, I want to mention also that the Bureau is the State Geological Survey of Texas, similar to, uh, to uh, Jerry's group over in Oklahoma. Uh, we're not a regulatory group. Uh, we interface uh, uh, very actively with the Railroad Commission of Texas, which is the regulator for oil and gas in the state. Um, this graph uh, shows over here on the left is the cumulative um, uh, earthquake events greater than a magnitude 3, and you can see really until about 2010, that was a fairly steady rate. The, uh, the uptick here uh, is to sort of an indication that uh, we also began seeing uh, our own earthquakes uh, that were occurring at about the same time that Oklahoma's ramped up. And, and the map on the right shows where the activity is occurring in the state, the East Texas, uh, East Texas fields around the, the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area and the uh, uh, Cogdell field and Snyder in, in central, kind of west central Texas, and then in the Permian in the south, the Permian Basin and, um, and South Texas in the Eagle Fort. So we're also seeing the same uh, uh, types of responses and, and the state has reacted in a couple of ways. Uh, in, in the first case, uh, the Railroad Commission of Texas in March of 2014 hired a state seismologist, this is Craig Pearson, uh, really to provide uh, technical support on earthquake issues across the state. Soon uh, after, in, in November, the Railroad Commission issued new regulations uh, designed to address disposal well operations in, in areas of historical or future, um, potential future seismic activity. And the bullets there really kind of define what the, uh, the changes in the reporting requirements and, and how a Railroad Commission interfaces with, uh, with operators. And, and one of the key things is really that first bullet there where uh, any, any uh, uh, proposed disposal well within, uh, uh, with, with, within a radius of about five point six miles, if there has been uh, seismic activity within that radius, uh, then the operators need to provide additional information uh, on, on what may be causing that to, to kind of help the Railroad Commission with, uh, uh, with the permitting. And on the bottom, I have the website where, the, you know, where all of these uh, regulations were, were put in place and uh, when they were reported, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing them here. Uh, later on uh, in, the, in, the, in the 2015 legislative session, uh, the, the Texas legislature essentially enacted the TexNet seismic monitoring uh, program uh, through what's known as uh, House Bill 2, and you can see what it was requiring the Bureau to do is uh, acquire, deploy, and maintain a seismic monitoring network, uh, and uh, uh, to model reservoir behavior of, for systems of wells in the vicinity of faults. This is essentially using reservoir models uh, to understand pressure buildup and, uh, and, and how they may be intersecting with, uh, with subsurface faults, uh, mostly down near the basement. And also to establish a technical advisory committee of, uh, of, of individuals from, from industry, from academia, from, uh, from local communities, as well as from, uh, from the state government. And, uh, and I'll kind of describe that as well. And then on the right is a graphic of a report with a web page uh, that we reported to the governor uh, last December, and it has a really nice description, and uh, um, it's fairly concise in about 60 pages of the entire program and where we stood uh, at the end of December. So I thought it would be instructive just to put graphically what has sort of happened over time since the ASL sequence in very late 2013 from the state response as well as how the Bureau was trying to uh, respond uh, to the funding and to the calls for information um, as the state surveyed, one of the mandates uh, that we have is to interface with the public and provide basic geologic information. So it required us to ramp up quite, quite, uh, quite quickly. And uh, you can see in, in, uh, in June of 2015, Governor Abbott signed House Bill 2. So uh, we immediately began uh, recruiting and acquiring uh, um, the seismometers to design the network to find the vendors to help us uh, get the equipment set up. Uh, we, we began uh, uh, scouting and deploying, um, you know, 
scouting for sites across the state of Texas, many of them uh, that are consistent with the, the sites that were used for the transportable array back about five years ago, seven years ago or so. And we started a consortium which is essentially an, an industry funded research group uh, that is really doing research and leveraging uh, funding from the state of Texas and, and doing research that helps fill in the gaps of the things that the state um, did not mandate us to do. And I'll, I'll kind of describe a little bit about how that's uh, um, how that's that's going and, and how we design that program and then in December we um, we deployed our first TechSnet site uh, in uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area we are uh, we're continuing to, to uh, scout uh, sites and get uh, the rest of the network deployed and I'll, I'll show you the, where we are on that so uh, the TechSnet uh, portion of this is really again this is the state portion to uh, to maintain the network uh, to do a fair amount of geo modeling and reservoir modeling and, uh, uh, and and you can see really what it is, where, what our goals are right here. Uh, the scissor is really meant to sort of fill in the blanks uh, uh, and the gaps in the research that we're just not able to do with the funding from the state. And, and the other thing that it does, which is very uh, helpful and very important, is it, is it gets uh, uh, operators uh, working with us directly. Uh, they have a lot of data, a lot of insight that we don't necessarily have at a university. And so getting everybody in the same room at the same time uh, really provides a, a very important forum for us to exchange information. And you can see, you know, the, the groups that we're trying to bring together through TechSnet and Scissor on that bottom left graphic and how the money is uh, split up across uh, uh, the different areas, the TechSnet research, uh, the seismic network, and then the funding we're getting from the, these, uh, these sponsors which are listed here. From an organizational standpoint, uh, several of the folks uh, that are listed on here, um, you're, you're, uh, you've already seen. So Jake Walter was uh, was at the University of Texas. He's now the state seismologist of Oklahoma, and so he really helped us, uh, along with Cliff Froelich, to to begin to very early planning for what this network would look like, and uh, and how how we would uh, essentially do the deployments and the operations, and how we could. A tie in to the other international networks at IRIS, at ANSS, and at the National Earthquake Information Center for the USGS. So the, the research we're doing uh, really falls along these uh, six pillars here. Uh, the seismic network uh, I, I mentioned before, which is really the deployment and operation of the network. The seismology is to take the data and make uh, sense of the data and, and locate earthquakes, the hypercenters, hypocenters, uh, and um, uh, and to essentially try to reduce the uncertainty of where these things are located. I, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, the Railroad Commission has a, uh, a hundred square mile area around a well, uh, you know, a proposed disposal well, and the larger the error and the uncertainty of the earthquakes, the more difficult it is to place uh, that circle. And so by minimizing the uncertainty, then everybody is able to uh, make decisions on, uh, with, with, less, with less unknowns. Uh, we obviously have a big hydrology uh, component of this, and how do the hydro, you know, how does the hydrologic response uh, intersect with uh, with faults, and how do we numerically simulate this within these large 3D geo models? Uh, and uh, the same with the geomechanics. We need to understand how the fault uh, the fault releases are occurring. We need to know how the rocks are breaking. What is going to be the response of of, uh, of reservoirs to large scale disposal of water? And uh, so we have folks from uh, Texas A&M that are involved in that, as well as uh, petroleum engineering at UT. And we have a, a, a number of projects uh, that we're looking in terms of seismic hazard and risk uh, to really understand uh, what might happen to infrastructure on the ground uh, if there is a, a large peak ground acceleration. What what effect does this really have for infrastructure and for buildings and urban? In urban centers, what does this mean to operators in the field and their equipment? And then uh, finally, how do we communicate all of this really complex information to the public? Um, the, we call this the bird's nest. It's fairly uh, complex, uh, but we're very keen on trying to integrate all of these, these different projects together because there's a lot of handshaking of information that goes back and forth uh, between the pillars, which are now uh, sort of listed over here on the, on the left side. And, uh, um, and you can see how they're all interconnected, having a lot of data uh, and trying to make sense of, of the data is very important. And in the end, we're really trying to, to develop a causative understanding where the correlation, yeah, we can see the correlation, but we need to understand specifically 
to the best of our of our abilities which one of the which fault is is uh, releasing are there specific wells that are to blame here is are some of these naturally occurring uh, if we're going to take uh, some sort of a policy action or regulatory action, are we taking the right one or are we simply drawing too large of a line here? And uh, so the cause of understanding helps us to react um, in, a, uh, um, in, a, in a clearer way. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, clar clarifying risks and hazards, mitigation strategies for avoiding uh, events in the future, and how can we improve business practices so the, uh, the water is, is safely injected um, you know, there are alternatives to injection, but many of them require uh, heavy haul trucks uh, driving along highways, and that's very, very, uh, that also has its own risks. So we're trying to simply balance safety uh, and uh, wise management of water with, uh, with the earthquakes. So uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the recording seismicity in Texas, again, you've seen this map before. Those red triangles that you're looking at uh, on that graph are the new TexNet stations. Uh, there are some green circles that in New Mexico that are part of the New Mexico network. Uh, we have uh, the green triangles that are on there are the existing stations. There were 17 or 18 existing stations in the state of Texas. And our job was to install 22 new stations, uh, adding to that network, and then about 33 additional uh, portable stations across the state depending on uh, on the timing and, and recorded earthquakes and if we need to rapidly deploy uh, because of an event we have the ability to do so. This is our current status. The, uh, the, the sort of the green circles around the red triangles, those are systems that are up and running. Uh, we are currently uh, uh, in the field actually uh, this, this week um, uh, scouting out additional sites. And, uh, and, and then the, uh, the portable sites are the, are the green diamonds up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. What makes uh, Texas a little bit challenging uh, is the fact that, every, uh, that, the, that the land is owned by, by, private, by private individuals and we need permission to go on to land and to, uh, to deploy sensors and to measure for uh, baseline noise conditions. And we've probably gone to over 100 different uh, landowners. Each one requires a separate agreement. We have landmen in two different parts of the state that are helping to facilitate these agreements. So it's very time and labor intensive to put a network like this together uh, to respect uh, homeowner rights and landowner rights in the state of Texas. But you can see where we are you know, and where we really began this process. Uh, it has been fairly arduous, but we think that the the quality of the data that we're getting is uh, is outstanding, and uh, it's already streaming to uh, to IRIS, and the data is already being used for citing earthquakes uh, in Texas and elsewhere. So the the, the network data uh, in in the products here, we're we're really trying to get the ground motion uh, data in real time, and uh, and as well as all the earthquake source information uh, to be made public. We expect uh, that to happen later this spring. Uh, where there's a, there's a uh, sort of a, a, a test period that the USGS uh, requires before the data are, are moved into the NEIC uh, and, the, and the rest of the, uh, the, the architecture that is being used worldwide. So, um, you know, the results uh, are also going to be used for updating a crustal velocity model of Texas right now. It's a 1D model. We intend to uh, scale that down so that we're using either a 3D model or a site-specific 1D model so we can improve uh, the siting of the earthquakes. I don't have the, the hard data right here, but to my understanding is that we've already reduced by five-fold the, uh, the error for the earthquakes in the state, both, uh, both vertically with depth as well as, uh, uh, as, well as laterally. Uh, we will be producing uh, near real-time shake maps, uh, or we'll be working with the USGS to improve those. So we have accelerometers on all of our uh, uh, all of our sensors, so that we can actually get peak ground acceleration. And we expect the data to be widely used by the research community, uh, by our in industry partners, by the regulators, with the Railroad Commission, and others. Uh, we've made a lot of contacts right now with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. They handle. Uh, 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 geological hazards and, and things like that, and uh, Texas Department of Transportation, they're very concerned about bridges, uh, bridge abutments, and other types of infrastructure that may cause uh, damage from sort of repeated low-level events. Uh, there's other stakeholder groups that have been in touch with us, and so we feel like uh, we have a place for the data to go and the information to go. Uh, 
I, I had a really nice animation uh, on here. I thought it would be kind of interesting. This is the first picture. We're really wanting to try to do is begin compiling all of the water injection across the Fort Worth Basin and, uh, and, and then to begin looking at where the faults are located, where the, uh, where the earthquake hypocenters are located, and where the injection wells are. So we can map all of those together and begin putting that into a large geo model. So you can see the amount of water that's been disposed in the Fort Worth Basin. Uh, we're, it's about just under 2 billion barrels of water so far uh, has been disposed of there. And, you know, you can see in the, uh, in the sort of the purple circles where the earthquakes are occurring and where the wells are located. And there's not, there's not great uh, causative uh, understanding here. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly scattered. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's not at all a simple solution here to understand why this is occurring. Uh, but, you know, just uh, compiling all of the data and the information into a single place itself is, 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 is time intensive. Uh, I think Oklahoma is, is uh, doing a great job at, at beginning to, to put all these data together to a single framework, and so we're trailing behind a little bit and trying to catch up. But uh, this is a challenge when you have uh, close to 8,500 uh, active injection wells in the state for saltwater disposal. So it's a, it's a lot of information to compile and put in one place. You know, all the data is being integrated, as I mentioned, to these uh, fairly large uh, subsurface uh, geo models, and this, this is just, a, I thought, a cool graphic showing, uh, you know, where the water is being disposed in terms of the injection intervals, where the earthquakes are occurring, uh, and the volumes are sort of uh, correlated to the size of the circles. Uh, of course, those are the, the injection wells that are holding those circles up. And all of these can be uh, put into uh, you know single platforms, so it gives us an opportunity to begin uh, looking at pressure uh, injections and uh, pressure perturbations in the subsurface as, as we go forward. We are doing a lot of work, uh, actually, for everything from looking at outcrop studies and individual fault architectures at, at outcrops all the way uh, to the to uh, compiling them into the subsurface. So. Uh, there's a, a, a number of field projects that are being done out in the out in the Lano, Texas area, because since it's the same uh, uh, the same rock formations that are essentially in uh, in Dallas Fort Worth, and 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 the uh, uh, and the the fault architecture and the and the joint the jointing and the directions of those is essentially considered to be equivalent as we go up into the Dallas Fort Worth area. So all of this is being compiled into a single a fault model of the Fort Worth Basin, and we're sort of looking a little bit to the northeast here. Uh, we have the Wichita thrust front on to the east and the Munster Arch to the north, and you can see where uh, the uh, uh, the pressure can be constrained by those uh, uh, those structural features. So, you know, these are things that we're trying to put together. We, we understand that uh, Dallas-Fort Worth is, uh, is one of the largest uh, metropolitan areas in uh, it's the largest, I believe, in the state of Texas, if, if not Houston. It's one of the largest in the country, and so there's, uh, there's a fair amount of, of activity and concern when you start getting earthquakes there. So we're trying to address this first in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then we'll do similar studies elsewhere. So in terms of an activities timeline, we're, we're still working. We expect uh, really by the end of this year to have a lot of the work done in terms of the integrated study in the Fort Worth Basin. We're already mo monitoring across the state and, and especially in West Texas. For those who are following the news in terms of oil and gas, I believe 50% of all the operating uh, rigs in the country right now are operating in West Texas. So there's a lot of focus on that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, activity and, and USGS just announced, I think, a co about a month ago, a, a 20 billion barrel, uh, um, they sort of characterized 20 billion barrels in one of the, one of the layers in, uh, uh, in, in the Permian Basin. So we know that there's going to be operations there for a long time, for years to come, and so we're planning to sort of move operations or move our focus from the Dallas-Fort Worth area when that's completed out to West Texas, and then eventually down to the Eagle Fort. And uh, with that, I'll stop and uh, happy to take any questions when, when we're done.